Okay, um, let's kick off. Uh, I, I'm really excited to talk about this, and I think it's fantastic that the uh, the organisers have have gotten together to, uh, to to talk about a really important theme, which is open science and reproducibility. Uh, so uh, this is uh, this is this is uh, such an important skill that I think uh, every every scientist should learn. We always talk about how um, the, the important skills that scientists should have, and a, a lot of that focus is on like you know, using LaTeX or learning Python, learning R. Um, but I'm convinced that learning open science and reproducibility is just as important, if not more important, than all those other skills. So uh, in the next few moments, I'm going to share with you uh, five things about open science and reproducibility that I think every early career researcher should know. Uh, I do want to get started, though, by uh, just explaining um, open science reproducibility is, is a really broad tent. So I'm going to be, I uh, just want to explain what I'm referring to what, when I talk about those things. Uh, in terms of reproducibil re reproducible analysis, um, something like using R or using Python is the best approach because anyone can reproduce your analysis. Um, that's for other people reproducing it. And uh, another issue, of course, is for yourself to re reproduce your, your own analysis in the future. Um, using something like SPSS is fine. There's nothing inherently wrong with SPSS other than other people might not be able to use it. Uh, other people might not be able to recreate your analysis. But if you want to recreate it yourself, uh, it's important um, to export your analysis as uh, SPSS syntax so you can easily reproduce the analysis yourself. A really good rule of thumb when it comes to how well you are reproducing or your, your analysis is asking the question, well, if I was to change one variable in my data set or add, add one additional thing, how long would it take to actually, to actually do, to redo my whole analysis? As much as we think that we have everything together when we submit our first manuscript, there's always gonna be a comment from a co-author or from a reviewer of, oh, have, have you considered adding this thing in? What, what happens when you do this? And uh, that can take a lot of time. If you can go back into your analysis and change one variable and it doesn't take that much extra time, then you have a reproducible analysis. Uh, another option is um, using JASP or Jamovi, which are free, um, uh, freely available software packages. Uh, if you can use SPSS, you can use this software. Quite often, I've, I've had a few clinical master students and um, they ask, oh, should I, should I, use, uh, should, should I learn R? And if, the, if you're not continuing academia, I don't think you necessarily need to. If what you can do can be done in, a, in, in JASP or Jamovi, and that happens when you have conventional analysis like t-tests, like correlation, like ANOVA, then you can do that because anyone, when you save this file, anyone else can actually open up the file and reproduce the analysis and look at your data set as well and see the script so they can, so they can do that. So if you're not gonna continue in academia and if, you're, if your analysis can be done in these, uh, in these software packages, then I'd recommend just doing that. It's much easier. It's point and click, but it can still be reproduced. Um, and the great thing about um, the Jamovi in particular is that people can actually write uh, extensions to improve and to, to extend the functionality. So for instance, someone's written an extension for Jamovi to do meta-analysis. And this is actually a wrapper of the popular metaphor R package. So these things are always expanding and they're a fantastic option. If you do want to do reproducible, reproducible analysis, but you don't think you're gonna be using R or Python uh, in the future. Uh, now, open data is another consideration. Um, I talk to a lot of people in different fields and they're like, yeah, just, just put your data online. But as we know, as we're working with quite sensitive data, um, it's not as simple as that. Um, if you can make, make it open, that's fantastic. Um, the thing is participants are more, um, uh, more interested in sharing the data than we think. There was a recent survey that was done, or there's been a number of surveys that have been done, and over 80 to 90% of participants are actually okay as long as there have been reasonable steps for anonymization. They are okay with sharing their data. But you have to ask them first. You, uh, asking people retrospectively is very difficult, um, but um, people are more open than you'd think. Um, but it, but it, it, even if there's a, there's a situation where you can't share the data, um, another great option are synthetic data sets. And these are data sets which, sh which share the same statistical characteristics as the original data set, yet no case or no, no individual in a synthetic data set actually represents a real person. Um, and so uh, th th these are, this is a great way to actually share your data. Other people can reproduce your analysis and, uh, and get almost exactly the same result. But the really cool thing is other people can actually explore your data set and potentially generate new hypotheses. Data collection, as we know, is expensive and time consuming, and it's also paid for by the taxpayer. So we should be making and getting the best bang for our buck out of the data that we have. And synthetic data sets 
uh, are a great way of doing that, of actually sharing sharing your data. And uh, and that's something that I'm exploring um, in, in a future trial as well, in that um, I'm planning a, a study for, for looking at uh, oxytocin administration in youth with autism. I'm going to ask people if they'd like to share their data, but if not everyone agrees, then I'll do a synthetic data set because there's no way of actually um, identifying people from these synthetic data sets. And it's a great way of actually extending the life of these data sets. Of course, there's also this, um, there's also the uh, posting preprints and postprints is another way of making sure that our science is, uh, is open and, and, reproducible, and, and re re reproducible. So it's a really important thing that we should all be doing. Um, uh, there's been study after study demonstrating that people or that papers that are posted as preprints end up getting more citations than papers that aren't. Uh, and they also get a lot of attention online on social media. And the great thing about preprints is you can then get feedback. You can get early feedback on your work, not just from your peer reviewers, but from the public, or it's not from the public necessarily, but from other scientists who can go through and give you feedback on your work. They're a fantastic tool. And it's a way of actually making sure that our research is open. And uh, two terms which are often used interchangeably, interchangeably are reproducibility and replicability. So um, just to give some definitions, they're very similar, but reproducibility, uh, a good definition that I like is whether you can get the same results using the same data. So uh, this is a, a good demonstration of if you can do this yourself, if, if in three years time, you can rerun the analysis and get the same, the same results. Whereas replicability is whether you can get the same results using the same this is the same analysis and new data. So does this, uh, does this replicate? And we all know that, uh, that uh, psychology and medicine is in the midst of a, rep a, rep a replication crisis. Um, so there are a lot of problems with this, but those are the two, th those are the differences between those two terms. Now, the first thing that you should know as an early career researcher about open science and reproducibility is that you will be a more competitive job candidate. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, the academic job market is crazy. Uh, there are for positions, PhD positions that we um, advertise within our own group. Um, there's at least 50 to 60 applicants per position. For postdocs, it's much the same. And for other universities in other countries, it's even higher. So things are hugely competitive right now. Now, an increasing number of job applications are specifying that um, open science practices are uh, either an advantage or either or, or a requirement. Um, there's, a, there's been a list posted, in fact, showing how much this is growing and how many jobs are out there, which actually specify that uh, this, is the, this is an important skill set. Because open science uh, tools take a while to develop, that's why these things are valuable. You can't, just, uh, or, or you can't just convert your practices or convert a lab into doing open science practices overnight. These things take time. So this is why these things are valuable and why a lot of people are asking for these things in their job advertisements. You will be, for many job advertisements, more competitive um, um, over and above the, the, the other people if you can actually demonstrate that you have or that you've been applying these open science practices. Um, and the, the other thing is uh, a lot of the sort of prestigious journals, all the ones that we want to publish in, are also requiring that we, um, that we use these, uh, these open practices, whether, whether it's about posting scripts or posting data. Um, more and more, this is, this is a becoming a requirement in order for, for us to publish in these high profile journals. So things are slowly changing, um, which is great. Um, but uh, that's something to consider that you, if you do want to publish in these journals, these are the sort of practices which you should be adopting. Another thing is uh, some of you are starting to begin to apply for grant applications. And um, in most, for most grant agencies, they also do ask um, what sort of uh, reproducible practices you'll be using and whether you'll be um, adopting open science practices. These uh, foundations, whether they're private foundations or public foundations, want to make sure they're getting the best bang for their buck. They're spending a lot of money. They're investing a lot of money in research. And if the research and if the data is tied up with the researcher, there's only so much that can be discovered. Whereas if your data is open or you're sharing your scripts or you're making your, 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 your science open, um, you can get much use, much more use out of, um, out of the research that's been funded. So that's why these, um, these applications, these, these grant, um, uh, grant giving uh, organizations are very interested in open science practices. And remember, anyone can say, oh, yes, I, I, I'm, very, um, I'm very pro open science, but it's much more powerful to go, yes, I've done this. And here's a demonstration. I've done X, Y, Z. I've posted my data. Uh, here is my open science framework page. Here are some examples of scripts. Here are some examples of data. That's much more powerful than someone who just says that they're all for open science because anyone can say that. So you'll be more competitive for your grant applications if you can actually get started and demonstrate these open science and reproducible practices. 
one common limitation that people say about open science is it takes too long. I don't have the time to do these things. And I'm not going to lie, when you're actually setting up your analysis, it does take longer time to do reproducible science, but you do save time in the long run. And in the long run, it actually takes about the same amount of time because invariably uh, people, um, whether it's going to be um, peer reviewers or whether it's going to be your collaborators after peer review, they're going to ask for changes. And if you have to recreate your analysis from scratch, that takes a long time. So over the long run, although it feels like reproducible practices take longer, you're actually saving time or saving or spending about the same amount of time for doing your science. The second point is that um, there's quite a few open science zealots out there and the, these people's in, intentions are great, um, but you almost get the impression that it's, it's all or nothing, that you need to actually apply all these things at once. Otherwise you're not true open science. And I think that's ridiculous. You pick up these tools step by step. Um, like I said before, these tools are valued because they take time to develop. So you don't need for your next paper, you don't need to do all these things at once. You don't need to think about how am I going to put my data online? How am I going to do pre-printing? How am I going to do um, a, 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 create a Docker image so that other people can reproduce um, my science? Do these things one thing at a time. It is not all or nothing. Um, and it becomes easier paper, paper by paper uh, as well. And you save time paper by paper because quite often you are doing similar analyses um, between your papers. So you can just take the scripts that you're using and you can use it for your new research. But every single paper, try and adopt a new tool and try and build your toolkit um, because it's gonna be so handy for you in the future. The third thing is that reproducibility builds credibility. Uh, all things equal, if I was to see two manuscripts um, which presented the same sort of data, the same authors, the same sort of story. If one of them had open data and code and one of them didn't, I'll trust the paper that has open data and code. People aren't necessarily going to go through your data. If, if they do, lucky you. Um, reviewers don't always do that. They sometimes do, but not always. But the papers or the people that say, hey, I, I back myself so much that here is the data and here is the scripts, have at it. Um, that builds a lot more credibility in, in, in your research if you're able to do that. And one thing that it does is it actually forces you. I mean, you should, already be, you should already be double and triple checking your data anyway, but by having your data and scripts public, it forces you to check, is this actually right? And it actually gives you self-trust in your own data that you can say, hey, I actually believe in this work myself because I've checked it so many times because I'm willing to put it online. So by doing this, it increases the trust that other people have and, uh, and they're much more likely to actually um, uh, believe in your results and cite them and build their own research on your results as well. So by doing that, you're actually building, you're building the trust in the research that you have. Now, the fourth thing is, I think we have to remember the, 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 the reason that all of us got into science, or I think the reason that most of us got into science is that we want to discover new things. Doing open science and re reproducibility uh, means that we can actually accelerate scientific discovery. This is a cycle, um, or the, the, the blue arrows represent how science should work, or the science or the hypothesis driven science that we're taught in high school, at least, where you specify a hypothesis, you design your study, collect the data, analyze the data, interpret it, and publish your experiment. That's how science should work. But unfortunately, that's not how science does work. Because right now, we have huge problems where papers aren't replicating. Um, when it comes to, to designing our studies, studies have low power, which means that um, the, the, the results are less likely to replicate and these papers aren't really sensitive enough to detect the effect sizes that we're really interested in. And there's problems with p-hacking as well because people haven't pre-specified their, their analyses and um, there's a lot of flexibility in their analysis. And people might say, yes, I, I don't have a, a financial conflict of interest, um, but almost everyone has an intellectual conflict of interest. We have an idea that we want to push. Maybe, maybe, maybe paper one in your thesis said one thing and you really want paper two to, 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 to say the second thing. Um, but um, if you have that flexibility, then um, perhaps the findings that you're getting are false positives. They're not going to necessarily replicate. And, um, and, and a really big issue is also publication bias in that um, a lot of the studies that was, a lot of the studies that uh, didn't find a significant result aren't getting published. Uh, this is changing. A lot of journals are now more likely to actually accept these papers, um, but still we have we have a big problem where journals are less likely to to publish or to accept a publication papers that have non significant results. And there's a big problem with a lack of data sharing as well, because um, when you can share your data, it means two things: 
it means that other people can verify your analysis, but it also means that other people can actually build on the data that you do have and, uh, and come up with their own hypotheses so they can actually confirm them in their future hypothesis-driven hypothesis research. Um, so by doing this, we can actually accelerate how quickly we're finding stuff and whether we can actually abandon findings as well. Um, uh, and I think it's funny, a lot of people in, in their papers or in the grant applications will post that graph going, there is increasing interest in my research area, therefore it must be important. And I saw someone on, on Twitter once say, well, isn't that happening with every single research field but i think is actually there's one example where there's been a massive dip and that's with mirror neurons have you heard of that term recently I, I haven't but i remember about a decade ago everything was about mirror neurons but then as soon as more studies came out to actually suggest that maybe they're not a thing or maybe they're not what we think they are then there was a massive drop in in in, in um actually investigating these things so i, I think a, a really good example uh looking back at this cycle is this idea of ego depletion it's an idea within psychology that some of you may have heard of but it's this fact that if you're if you're doing a particular task, um, for, for instance, you know you, you've been if you've been working all day, um, working on a particular task, and then you're you're more, you're you're less likely to be able to resist eating chocolate cake late at night. And that the, this idea that your self control works like a muscle and a transfer which transfers between domains. Um, I was enamored by this idea. I, I in fact did this for my honors thesis, which is the equivalent of a master's thesis back in Australia, because I thought this idea was really cool. And originally when they were reporting this, the, the, these effect sizes were massive that you could actually manipulate how people's self-control operated uh, with a Cohen's D of 0.6. Um, but then study after study had come out to actually say, well, maybe it's not as actually big or the effects are as big as we thought. And only a few days ago, a study came out with, uh, with, with 4,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 participants attempting to replicate um, the original studies alongside the authors or some of the authors of the original studies to, to make sure they were doing it the same way. And the effect sizes are tiny. So there's so many people that actually were chasing dead ends because of a lack of publication, because of publication bias, because people weren't publishing their null results. Um, the result I got from my thesis wasn't published because there, it was a non certificate result. Um, people are also p-hacking. So there's huge problems. And just, just, just to think about the amount of people who waste, the amount of person hours that has been wasted from people actually pursuing these dead ends because they weren't actually using these open science and reproducible practices. So the, the final thing or the fifth thing is that your future self will thank you if you're using these practices. Uh, you will save time. You will save time by doing this. Uh, the amount of times, at least in the past, where I did analysis in SPSS and then the reviewer says, change this thing. And it takes me days to figure out what I actually did until I finally get the same results. Um, that's just, that's, that's, that's sloppy science and it's going to lead to mistakes. But by actually having these reproducible analyses, um, you can save time when you have to make these changes as well. And, uh, and sometimes you'll get an email about two years later going, hey, um, I've got an hypothesis. Um, you have this variable in your data set, but you didn't actually report the, the, the analysis. Can you help me out? If you've actually made your data reproducible, it's very easy to go, yep, cool. Give, give, me, give me a day. Um, you, can, you can open up your script, put the, put the variable in, and you can get the result very quickly. So uh, your future self will thank you and your future self does not return emails as well. So how do you get started? Uh, start tomorrow. Uh, start as early as you can if you haven't already adopted these things because this is a key skill in science. I think it's important as well. Um, you don't have to ask permission from your mentors necessarily to actually do these things. Just uh, data is a different story, but um, just make this part of your manuscript and go, hey, like here, here's the analysis scripts. Um, that you can post on Open Science Framework, for instance, um, and make it a part of your workflow. Just, just, just start doing it. No one's going to tell you to stop, but sometimes you say, oh, we're going to be doing this thing. Um, so, some people are a little bit resistant to change or to new things, and they're going to be like, oh, let's just keep doing it the old way. Just, just do it. <laughs> people are very rarely going to stop you from doing it, and uh, it, it's going to give you important practice for, for doing these things. In order for, to learn these skills, the best resource for learning these skills is Twitter. Um, people are sharing... Uh, tips and tricks all the time and you can just there's such a fantastic community of people out there who are helping each other out um, for how to actually um, apply these things people are posting powerpoint presentations people people are posting all sorts of things important papers when it comes to open science and reproducibility um, everything that i've learned when it comes to these things um, about 95 percent has been twitter and five percent has been academic papers the majority has been there 
So if you're not if you're not involved, uh, I know I sound like a broken record, but if you're not involved or you um, you're not active on Twitter, I'd highly recommend doing that uh, because you can get uh, so much feedback when it comes to to applying these things. Um, I, I I've been invited to do a lot of talks on social media, and I got to the point where I'm like I'm I'm saying the same sort of stuff. So I ended up writing a book, a free book online for the practical ways step by step to use Twitter if you're a scientist. So if you're interested. I'll check that out, t4scientist.com. And um, there's heaps of tips. And there's even a one-month uh, boot camp. So if, you, if you're like, I don't know what to tweet, uh, I, I'll give you some tips on what you can be tweeting every day so you can get more involved in on Twitter. So uh, finally, I do want to share what is now the, the gold standard of reproducible hypothesis-driven science, which is the registered report. Uh, I've been really excited about this format. I've reviewed a few myself, and I'm actually planning two this year, two registered reports. So doing it is, 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 a, is going to be a really cool experience. But the idea behind a registered report is that you, um, rather than actually collecting your data and submitting your paper and getting your paper reviewed, you submit your paper for review before you collect data. You propose your rationale or your introduction, your method. So you write a paper as normal and you send that to get peer reviewed. And if the reviewers and if the editors agree that this is a good experimental design, um, that, your, that, your paper, that your study is sufficiently powered or your, your design is, is appropriate, then that will give you in principle acceptance. So that regardless of your results, they will publish your paper. Now this is a massive relief um, I'm, planning a, I'm planning a big trial, which is going to take a lot of resources. And to think that even though I've designed it well, that if I happen to get a non-significant result, it's not, it's not going to get published in a high-profile journal. That, that, that's the whole, the whole two years of the trial. I'm, I'm going to be very worried. But by submitting this as a registered report to hopefully a prestigious journal, then uh, before I, I've even collected a single data point, I'm going to know no matter what I do, this paper is going to get published in presti pre prestigious journal because the reviewers and the editors were happy with the design that whatever result that we get, that's the data that we've covered all our bases. We have, um, we've done the appropriate sort of analysis. We have, uh, we have enough participants in there and we're asking the right questions. So this is a, this is a fantastic way of doing science. Um, over 250 journals now use registered reports. Um, they also do registered reports for already available data. I know a lot of people listening um, use data such as UK Biobank, which is online. And of those 250, about half of them also accept um, uh, uh, registered, registered reports for data that already exists. So there's some flexibility there. So it's a great way of doing your science. And uh, you don't have to do that run around of, oh, hey, papers got rejected, next journal, next journal, next journal. Whereas from the very beginning, you can actually get your, um, get your work set up. Because the most frustrating thing particularly if you're collecting data is for the reviewer to go, well, why didn't you test this population? You didn't test this population, so I'm going to reject it. With a registered report, they, they give you that feedback initially and they'll say, why don't you, um, why don't you include females? And you go, okay, okay, I'll include females. And, and then you, you're getting all that information beforehand when you can actually do something about it rather than afterwards when you can't do anything about it. Um, Look, the, the, the quality of, of registered reports, uh, there, there was a, a recent preprint demonstrating that, um, that uh, on, on almost every metric, these papers are much better quality because the reviewers have to be satisfied with no matter what the result is, they're satisfied with the result, whether it's positive or negative. Um, but what, what I do want to show you is that um, the, the registered reports uh, magically inflate null findings, that you're, more, you, you're much more likely to find these null findings compared to the 10% of null findings that we get with traditionally published papers, um, which, which is quite frankly impossible. Um, whereas you get a, a high number of null findings with registered reports because these papers are getting published. And that's, um, that's, that's really good to see. So publication bias is really distorting the literature. And the theories cannot develop without falsification. Because right now we have a situation where, oh, the paper was, um, uh, was a non-significant result. Oh, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't enough participants. But with registered reports, paired with techniques where you can actually um, um, uh, support the null hypothesis, there are ways you can actually falsify theories, which is really important for um, doing hypothesis-driven research. And uh, looking at pre-registration, not necessarily registered reports, it's incredible how much that pre-registration can shrink your effect sizes. This is, this is a really startling figure where you can actually see that papers that aren't pre-registered, the average effect sizes are much higher than papers that are registered. So as well as actually um, reducing the publication bias. It also, um, any paper that you see, um, particularly for better analyses, um, the papers, that, the effect sizes that you're getting are very likely to be inflated. 
um, because uh, essentially non-pre-registration inflates your effect sizes, which has implications for these things. So I'll finish up with this with this plot or this figure. This is a plot that we often see when it comes to the hierarchy of evidence. With uh, at the bottom, there should actually be your cousin's opinion on Facebook, but all the way up, you get these these increasing levels of evidence until we get to the gold standard, which is the meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. Um, but I think this is perhaps a more accurate way of looking at evidence um, uh, because we know that these randomized controlled trials, even if pre, even if they're pre-registered, are open to bias. Um, whereas if we're actually working towards results that can replicate by having these meta-analyses of registered reports, these are the sort of things that we can trust. And when it comes to trust, there's a, there's a really good demonstration for, um, for instance, uh, NASA um, building uh, building rockets that work are really important because people's lives are literally on the line. So they have a set of how ready is this technology, TRL technology, the te technology readiness level. And it goes from one where we're just thinking of an idea to nine when they can actually, you know, fly the rocket, for instance. Uh, and th th there's been a, a recent push to actually have the same sort of thing for psychology and psychiatry to think about how ready is this to actually apply in the public domain? So you can look at this and think, oh, where is my research at? Is it at the point where we can go, yeah, yeah, you know, there's there's some evidence there, but we can't make this we can't make this prime time. You have to really think about um, what sort of evidence that you do need in order to actually get your work there. And by doing open and reproducible science, I believe you can get there a lot faster. So I just want to finish up. Uh, I do want to thank my funders, and these funders are fantastic because each of these funders, um, particularly the Cavley Trust and um, uh, are very behind open science and reproducible practices because they want to make the best use out of their money. So uh, a big shout out to, to, to my funders who are very supportive of open science and reproducibility. So thanks thanks for listening. Um, obviously, I'm very all for um, uh, social, social media because I learn a lot there. So this is where you can find me. And uh, a lot of these discussions about open science re reproducibility, um, I do on Everything Hurts. And we're actually going to have a conversation, which is sort of going to be an episode with, with, with James Hebbers later this afternoon. So yes, thanks for listening and uh, really, really keen to answer any questions that you might have.